Welcome to the Real Church Podcast. You can learn more about Real Church online at realchurch.today. Now here's today's message. I want you to turn to your Bibles. Y'all know where, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And you probably wondered all week, what in the world is pastor going to preach out of 2 Corinthians chapter 11? Well, on Mother's Day. We're going to talk about all them tribulations and trials that Paul went through. No, 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 no. I want you to look at verse number three. It just leapt off the pages at me. It says, but I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his trickery, your minds will be led astray from sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Genesis chapter three. Verse number one. Now the serpent was more cunning than any animal of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, say this with me, woman. woman. I want you to remember this. And he said to the woman, and by the way, uh, it was Adam that called her woman. Y'all, y'all know I love to talk about that. You know what I'm going to say. She walked in the room. He said, whoa, man. And God said, I know. I did good. Yeah. It's a woman. Yeah. Anyway, woman. I Means she was taken out of man. How I many of y'all know Eve had to be the hottest woman ever made? Right? She had to be. God did that. Hand, I mean, hand carved her. And, and I, I thought about this. If you want to know the miracle of God, he took one of the ugliest part of man to make the most beautiful thing he ever made. He pulled a nasty old bloody rib out of the side of the man. And I read, it, I read several translations about that, and it said the Lord fashioned her out of the rib of the man. <laughs> You've heard preachers say, well, God said after I made man, I messed up so bad, I better get it right this time. <laughs> Might be a lot of truth in that, I don't know. <clears throat> but he made woman. And this is what, God got, this is what the servant said. He, said. he said to the woman, has God really said, wow, you shall not eat from the, any tree of the garden, the woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, you certainly will not die, for God knows that on the day that you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will, you will become like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took some of its fruit and she ate. And she also gave some to her husband with her and he ate. And then the eyes of both of them were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves waist coverings, clothes. I was thinking this morning, there's some women in the Bible that get a lot of press, and uh, I think if you'll hear this out today, you'll know where I'm coming from the, with this statement. I, I probably, Mary has gotten the greatest press of any woman in the Bible because she was the earthly mother of Jesus. She carried the Lord and Savior, Jesus. She changed his diapers. Come on, y'all. Man, what a lady, right? And uh, she got to walk with, man, oh, goodness gracious. She probably spilled the milk, and Jesus said, be dry. And it just, uh, you know, I mean, I mean what a kid to raise. Huh? Never spanked him, didn't never have to spank him, never had to tell him no. He was perfect. And, um, and so we kind of equate all of that perfection with her. Now, what we do know about her is she was holy and righteous, and she was, she was a virgin like she's supposed to be and all those things. But I think it's fair to say she was not perfect. But I think the church has made her out perfect, so she gets the greatest press. Uh, but today, I want to, you know, the Bible says you ought to give flowers to people while they're alive. And I think probably if we turn that around, probably the most judged woman in the Bible, come on, y'all, is woman. That's what Adam named her, woman. Woman, taken out of man, most judged woman in the world. And we say, well, we get to heaven. You've heard people say, well, I'm going to talk to Eve about how you messed it all up. I'm going to talk to Adam about listening to your woman and messing the thing up, messing up the garden, messing up the perfection. 
But I hope today you're going to see Eve in a little different light when we leave here today. First thing I want to do, it would, it, wouldn't be, it would be foolish for us to talk about her life and not at least address her failures. I've done many funerals, and I don't go to funerals and talk about people's failures, but 100% of the people at every funeral I've ever been in is aware that there were failures in the life of mama and grandma and great-grandma, and the list goes on and on. We just don't talk about it at funerals. We talk about the good things, amen? But today, Eve is dead and gone, so I don't get to do her funeral. And so we reflect on her life. And I want to just take this little uh, moment here, just a moment to talk about the failure that happened in the garden. And maybe we can just kind of glean some lessons out of it. First, I want to tell you this. You need to be careful who you spend your time with. <laughs> I read that story fresh this week. It just kind of jumped at me. What are you doing? What are you doing hanging out near the tree that God told you not to eat with? Well, I'll tell you why. She's keeping bad company. Why are you hanging out with the serpent? Why are you listening to what he has to say? Ladies, be careful who you spend your time with. Mama said, Choose your friends wisely. I didn't always listen to her, and it cost me pain in my life. Be careful who you hang out with. Find somebody that in your life that you know loves God and has the joy of the Lord on their face. Don't pick you out somebody that's down in the mully grubs all the time to be your best friend if you're going to have a best friend. But find somebody who is full of the Spirit of God, who loves God, and is going to encourage your life and do things around you that's going to bring joy to your life. Hallelujah. Find somebody wise. Don't tell you, that doesn't tell you things that, that are not right and, and wisdom. And so be careful who you hang out with, who you spend your time with. Choose the voices that you listen to wisely. Not only are your friends going to be there to encourage you and, and, uh, and to uh, be a, you know, a, a, a somebody, a support to you, but their voice is important. You know, I, listen, we've got to be in the world but not of the world. We're going to have some friends that are not Christians. You need to be careful about listening to their voice. I'm not telling you don't have them in your life. They need you. You need to be the one encouraging them. But you've got to be careful. Make sure that you are rubbing off on them and they're not rubbing off on you. You are there to reprove and rebuke and restore people not to glean from the world. Woo, pastor, that's heavy stuff this morning. Choose the voices you listen to wisely. That can include your radio, your television, your television. <laughs> Thirdly, stick to the truth and nothing but the truth, so help me God. The devil says, oh, 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 God said, let's, I, you know, wouldn't it have been a better conversation if Eve, or if, if, uh, if Eve would have said, shut up. That is not true. That is not what God said. You better learn how to say that. I don't want you to say shut up to anybody else. But you can say shut up to the devil. And he will talk to you. And, uh, you know, the, the song says he, God walks with us and he talks with us and, and we find out that we're his own. Well, listen, the enemy is, he's always trying to raise himself up as God. That's the beginning struggle. That's what happened in heaven when he got booted out of heaven. This is what he's trying to do in Adam and Eve's life at that point. And he'll do it in your life too. He's always trying to exalt himself and act like he's like God. But the truth is he is nothing like God. And listen, I don't care how loud he talks I don't care what garbage he says to you you have the authority in the name of Jesus to turn around and say Satan get off my shoulder shut your mouth I'm not gonna listen to you I only listen to truth <laughs> truth how many of y'all know the truth will set you free she could have been freed from all of that right there in that moment she did this get off me devil I don't mm -mm, No. so stick to the truth Ladies, 
Love the truth, honor the truth, speak the truth, live the truth, fill your heart with the truth, read the word, study the word, let it empower you with the truth of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Fourthly, maintain your focus. Never let your eyes get distracted off your faith. He said, look at that, boy. Look at that tree. It must have been a good-looking tree. Must have been a good-looking fruit. By the way, it was not an apple. When they ask you that test on your ordination test, don't, don't click apple. The answer is not apple. That was not an apple tree. It was called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and it had fruit on it, and you could eat it, and you received the knowledge of good and evil. That's why all of a sudden they looked down and said, We're naked! They were naked and afraid. Wah, wah, wah. XL. <laughs> and they wasn't supposed to be because before that, they had no knowledge of evil. There was nothing they could do that was evil. There was no evil in the world. If you said evil to Adam and Eve in the very beginning, they would have looked at you and said, what is evil? And if you would have looked at them and said, here is morality, it is good, they would have said, we don't, we don't know anything about good. What is good? What, what do you mean moral? What do you mean evil? We don't know anything about that. There was no knowledge in their heads and in their hearts about good and evil because everything was perfect. But they ate of that fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and all of a sudden now everything is changed. Maintain your spiritual focus. Don't let anything get your focus off of your faith. Maintain your faith. Don't let the world take your faith. Listen to me. Oh my goodness, we talked about this yesterday at length. Don't let false, don't let false prophets in the last days who are going to be plentiful come into your life, whether by the TV or by the radio or by your, tele, your, your cell phone or by some church somewhere. Don't let a false prophet rob you of the true faith you have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And lastly... And this will be enough about her little failures here. <laughs> Never misuse your influence. I don't think there's anybody in, in my life that's had more influence on my life than women. I've had some great men in my life. I've been blessed with some great mentors. And uh, some of them you've met. You've met Pastor Smith. He's been a mentor to me. He's wonderful. Pastor Granberry, uh, Pastor Parrott, I mean, it just, Pastor Campbell, the list just goes on and on of people who have been great mentors in my life and blessed me. But I got to tell you, man, women have influence because we see them more than we see men. Men go off to work. We're at home with mama every day. My mama's faithfulness influenced me. My mama's prayer life influenced me. My mama's uh, faithfulness to her family influenced me. She was always there. When I went off to school, I heard other kids crying about they couldn't call their mama because their mama was gone. They didn't know where she was. We, I was raised in the days of no cell phone. Before cell phones, we had to live by faith. Before cell phones and credit cards, let's put it that way. We had to live by, and that's facts, that's true, right? Before cell phones and, you know, credit cards, we live by faith. Now we don't have to do that. We just pick up the phone and dial 911. We got all we need. But, but, but I wasn't raised in that, and so I, I knew. And I would tell my friends, I don't understand. I can pick up the phone anytime and call my mama, and she's always there. <laughs> I learned faithfulness and support from my mother. And, uh, and because of that, because of what moms do, Rachel read it to you out of the Bible a while ago, because of what moms do, it causes us to receive their influence. Don't misuse your influence. I watch people all the time that don't mean to, but they misuse their influence. They teach their kids how to be alcoholics. They teach their kids how to be addicted to to tobacco. They teach their kids how to be addicted to pills. They, come on, y'all. Y'all know I'm talking right. They, they, they teach their kids how to be depressed. They, they teach their kids how to be angry and mean and vindictive and manipulative. Don't misuse your influence. Maintain your godliness and let God use that influence in a godly way. 
How many of y'all know godly folks, we don't manipulate people. We pray for people. We live before people. We try to lead people. We don't try to force people. How many of y'all know God's not a goat herder? He's a shepherd. Shepherds walk in the front. Goat herders walk in the back. God wants you to be a shepherd to your family and the people in your life. Enough of that. That is not the message today. The message today is titled, The Turn. The Turn. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning because this is powerful revelation for you and I. You remember the story of Joseph in Genesis chapter 50. He was sold into slavery by his own brothers and forsaken for dead. And then they raised him up out of the pit because they felt guilty about that and sold him off into Egyptian slavery. Genesis chapter 50 verse 20. God did something in his life that was crazy. He said to his own brothers, you know, you know the story of Joseph. He ends up in Potiphar's house. He's wrongfully accused of something he did not do. He was thrown into prison. But God used him and God raised him up and through the work of God and the giftings of God on his life, he is now second in command to Pharaoh himself and, and God has given him a plan and a vision to save the world of his day from the drought that's about to kill everybody and now God has restored his family into his presence and his brothers are scared to death. They said, oh my Lord, he's probably, he's got the power to have our heads cut off right now and they're standing in front of him but you know what the Bible says Joseph looked at his brothers and his father and he said you meant to hurt me to harm and you meant evil for me but he said God say this with me turned God turned hallelujah he said God turned your evil into good you meant it for good you meant it for bad you meant it for evil but God turned it to good look at this to save the lives of many people which is being done right now in other words the corn that I've been storing for all these years God is using it to save people from dying in this drought we're not going to lose any cattle we're not going to lose any sheep and by the way I'm just pulling y'all all back in with me I know y'all meant it for bad but just know this the plans that you made God has turned those plans around and he's made it for my good hallelujah Oh, come on, it gets better. You ain't, you ain't there yet. You will be here in just a minute. So then in Genesis chapter 3, verse 20, there's something that happens in this verse that we all seem to just forget and we don't remember. And I'm going to remind you of it, and it's going to change your thinking about Eve. The Bible says in Genesis 3 and 20 that the man named his wife Eve. Now, the name derives from an early form, look at this, of the verb... Wait, I thought, I thought names were nouns. Nope, not in this case. He named her from a verb that means to live. One translation says the, now listen, the proper definition of the word Eve is the first woman. Look it up. It just says the first woman ever created Eve. Well, the word Eve in the Hebrew can mean a couple of things. It means life. Or life giving that's that's a verb and so he derived this name E from a verb because she said the Bible says because she was the mother of all the living now here's what I want to show you when God brought Eve before Adam it was just like when God brought the animals before Adam. Remember what happened? God said, here's this. Name it. He said, that's a monkey. A monkey, that's what Miles says. That's why I said it that way. A monkey. Well, what is this? That's a donkey. What is this? That's a lion. And it goes on and on and on. And God says, well, for this next one, baby, I got to knock you out. Because she's going to be a knockout, so I might as well just go and knock you out anyway. <laughs> Say amen, Dave. <laughs> and so he woke up. He hasn't forgot what God told him. When I bring something to you, you name it. So he says, well, God don't have to tell me this time. This name easy. 
woman. My grandpa, <laughs> my godly grandpa, oh, I loved him so much. He walked in the joy of the Lord. He was a laugher. He laughed when he preached. He laughed when he played. He just laughed all the time. And he just loved to stir up joy. If the house was a little dead, he'd do stuff to my grandma to get some joy going. And one of his favorite things to do, he'd say, woman. <laughs> he'd look at us and say, hey, boys, watch this. And she'd be in the kitchen. She'd say, hey, woman, you don't call me that. And then he preached to her. Oh, no, that's what Adam named Eve when she came along. She was woman. Well, see, something happened along the way. And woman has messed up. And man, why do we let him off the hook? He's supposed to be a man of God, the first man, the Adam you know, and he, 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 he's just as guilty as her. I love the fact that you don't ever hear any arguing between Adam and Eve in the Bible. They didn't have no discussion about who was wrong. They both realized we both messed this up. How many of y'all know we are in this together? <laughs> yeah, and he says, so... Uh, so 1 Timothy 2.13 says, For it was Adam who was first created and then Eve. See, Eve stopped being called woman right after she messed up. And now the Lord says, in the curse, he says, you're going to be cursed. And in childbirth, all you women say, thank you, Eve. For all the curses that you have in your female situation. That's where it came from. And he said, he says, he says, now when you have children, you're going to cry your eyes out. It's going to be painful. It's just going to be hard. And it's all because of the fall. And oh, by the way, Adam, I'm not letting you off the hook. You know that garden that you love so much and you just love taking care of? Guess what? The rest of your life now, the rest of humanity, everybody's going to have to pull thorns and thistles out of it. And you can and cactus and you name it and ants and everything else that gets on us and bites us. And that serpent that used to just talk to you, now he's going to have poison in his lips and he's going to bite you and impregnate you with poison. And, and, and there's going to be th th this, you know, all all kinds of insects that's going to crawl. Spiders are going to bring great fear in your life. It all happened because of what y'all did in the garden. How many of y'all know God never, ever takes people to a place they can't get out of? So here's what Paul told Timothy. He said, for it was Adam and Eve, or it was Adam who was first created and then Eve. And it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman was deceived, and she became a wrongdoer. But look at this. But women, oh, man, this gets so good. Women will be preserved through childbirth. And if they, content, if they continue in faith, love, sanctity with moderation. Here's what the Lord said. Hey, since Adam renamed you mother of the living, I want you to know something. Childbirth. It's what's going to save the world from their sins. I always misinterpreted that scripture. Growing up, I struggled with that scripture. You will be saved in childbirth. And so I thought, well, wait, God, there's some women that ain't going to have no babies. They can't have babies. How can they be saved? That, that's a bad translation for us. Read it this way. God said the preservation of humankind is going to start in a childbirth. Not in Eve, not in you, but in a childbirth that happened in a manger in Bethlehem some 2,000 years ago. The world will be saved if you do these things. So we changed her name from woman taken out of man, and now we call her Eve, the mother of all the living, the Bible says. One translation says the life-giving the life giver or the woman who was named life. God changed. Remember, look, come on, y'all. We remember this. Sarah was changed from Sarah to Sarah or from Sarah to Sarah. Come on, y'all. <laughs> Israel was changed from Israel to Jacob. That wasn't a good thing, by the way. 
And now you need to know Eve had a name change. She went from woman to Eve because now I'm talking about life because God said, look, if you're going to mess it up this bad and you're going to bring sin into all the world by my first little family that I'm putting together here, then I'm going to do something in y'all that's going to change the world. I'm going to bring into women the, the ability to bring life into the world. And there's a lady going to come one day who's going to bring life into the world that y'all don't know anything about yet. His name is Jesus, the son of the living God, and he will save my people from their sins. Hallelujah. Now, whoo, we ought to name more girls Eve. Hallelujah. Because in the story of Eve, we not only find the failures and some things we need to avoid, but Paul now gives us some powerful keys to our salvation. So I just put it this way, how to guard ourselves from spiritual failure, because we can learn it through the words of Paul about what Eve did and how we can be saved. First, he said, continue in faith. I wrote it this way, persevere in faith. Persevere in faith. Push on in your faith. Paul even says sometimes all you'll be able to do is stand, but stand in your faith. Don't ever, know, don't ever let go of your faith. Don't ever stop believing. Don't ever stop living the book. Don't ever stop believing the Bible. I don't care how many people say how many things. You just stick to the good book, my grandpa said, and you live out your faith, and you stand strong in your faith. And sometimes, you know, Paul didn't say just stand there. He stands stand there with your, your, all this armor of God on, but he throws in there the shield of faith. Hold on to your faith. If you're going to stand still in the battle, you better have faith in front of you. Amen. And you just don't let go of your faith. You just don't let go of your faith. You just keep believing. My grandma wrote in her diary, I should have brought it. Y'all would love to see it this morning. I should have brought it for an illustration. It's a beautiful little book my grandpa made for her. And, and, and she wrote in that diary. And one of the last things my grandma wrote, she had children that were not saved. And she said, God, she had hardening of the arteries and, and uh, she was dying from it. And she knew, she had prayed about it, and she asked the Lord, are you going to heal my body? And the Lord said, I'm going to heal you, I'm going to bring you home. You're going to be whole, but you're going to be home. I'm bringing you home. And my, my, my grandmother wrote this in her diary, it's so, so powerful. She said, I have talked to the Lord about this situation. <laughs> and she said, the Lord said, I am done with you there, I'm bringing you home. She said, I'm fixing to pass this life. She said, but if I know anything at all, I know this one thing. She said, I have prayers that are not answered yet. I have not seen the answer, but God has answered them. So although my body is going to die and decay in the ground, my spirit is going to heaven. And the prayers that God has stowed up in the vials of heaven, he is going to open up under the altar of God, and he's going to let an incense come out of there. And it's going to be the saving of my children and my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren. And the list is going to go on and on and on and on and on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Woo! Hallelujah. And I'm watching her great, great grandchildren. Oh, come on. You want to get a preacher excited. We finished our last regular season baseball game Friday night, and it was a, it was a nail biter. Well, Matthew and ask Matthew and Lauren, uh, Veronica after it, after church, they'll tell you it was crazy. It was just a back and forth and we ended up winning by one run and it was a walk off fly, M M Malcolm, it was a walk off fly ball into center field. I got it on video, I'll show it to you. It's awesome. Place went crazy. And so they had planned this little party. One of the families brought hot dogs and stuff. We're going to have a little party after. Now, this is just all impromptu. Everybody's left. The stadium's empty. Everybody's gone. But our team is over there, and we're having a little end-of-season party, you know, eating hot dogs and watermelon and cookies and drinking. And little Micah goes up to the very top of the stadium. Oh, man, I'm telling you, I like to lost it. He went to the top of that stadium, and he laid his stuff down, and he stood up. He said, hey, everybody. And he started preaching. I tell you, I, 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 I've never seen anything like it in my life. He said, I just want to tell you. And I, can't, I, I, I got it on tape if you want to watch it. We ought to play it. Maybe we'll play it tonight. That'll start revival off. Amen. I'm telling you, he told them why we, that why we have done this. He said, we've stuck together as a team. And he said, God has blessed us. And he said, God is with us. Hallelujah. <laughs> 
And I said, come on, boy, live out your faith. I think about your great grandma, uh, you know, in heaven. She says, I already wrote it. She already wrote it in her diary. You know, she wrote me a letter when I wasn't, I, I, I needed God bad. And she wrote me a letter saying, you're a good boy, and I know you're going to live for God. I said that later, I said, that woman was a great woman of faith. She had great faith. Not so great in Israel. We've never seen it. Of his great faith that I would be good. Oh, my Lord. Oh, my Lord. Persevere in your faith. Take it to your grave. I stood in a room with Barbara Parker, a lady who I'd never met, her and her husband, Billy. Their, their, son, their son and daughter-in-law attended our church where we were, our home church, when we were evangelists at one point. And my pastor asked me to go to a hospital visit, and we went to see a lady who was supposed to be dying in a few days from cancer. We, neither one of us had ever met her, and her son said, well, she came in from Livingston. Her pastor's not up here, and he wanted to know if we'd go visit her. And the pastor said, yep, and he called me. So we go up there, and, and, and we didn't know what to expect, and we walk in this room, and we're greeted by this lady. Now, what we thought, I, listen, I have, I have visited many people dying with cancer, and, and it's never fun. It's, it's not a fun visit, and, uh, and you, you know, people are in pain and and this lady was ate up with cancer i know she was in tremendous pain and we walked in and and she had her eyes closed and her her husband greeted us with a real loud voice hey y'all come on in and boy she just lit up and said, oh pastor i'm so glad to meet you blah, 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 blah. and and for 45 minutes she ministered to us and she said and 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 pastor's like oh my goodness he said we came here to encourage you he said but boy he said, y'all, you're lifting our faith up. She says, yeah, my son, yeah, I want y'all to pray for my son and daughter. She said, she said, they're in their 30s, and they come up here last night, and they come, and they made everybody leave the room because they said they needed to have a serious talk with me. And she said, they stood right there at the foot of my bed, and they were both crying like a couple of babies, and they said, oh, mama. We did. And she said, stop that. You stop that crying, and you're not going to stand over my bed and give me some naysayer story while I'm about to go meet Jesus in heaven. She said, if you knew the God I knew, you wouldn't be sad right now. You'd be excited that your mama has a future in heaven. Y'all suck those tears up and be grown-ups. I said, you pray for a pastor. I, I can't get to that level. I'm, whoa. Wow. <laughs> He said, I think we need to get her to pray for us. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Brother Parker says, y'all think that's something? He said, the night cleaning lady was up here going around, and she was asleep, and the little cleaning lady was humming Amazing Grace. And she woke up. Me and you got this going on too, right? Sister Nix, me and you. Yeah. Me and Sister Nix was singing. She don't remember. She was kind of half out of it. It's probably good so you didn't hear my voice and all that. But anyway, we, me and her was singing Amazing Grace at the hospital a few weeks ago. And, and so the little cleaning lady came in, and she's singing. And so Sister Barker woke up. And the little lady said, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to wake you. She goes, no, 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 no. What were you singing? She said, I was singing Amazing Grace. She said, can we sing it together? Yes, ma'am. So Brother Parker said, here was the cleaning lady leaning on her broom, her mop. And her and Barbara singing Amazing Grace. He said when they got to the second verse, the door opened up. One of the nurses slipped in, and she joined in. Three of them singing Amazing Grace. By the third verse, two more nurses walked in. He said by the time we were at the end of Amazing Grace, four verses, we had nine nurses gathered around this bed singing Amazing Grace to the Lord. Hallelujah. He said, I'm telling you, they didn't just sing Amazing Grace. Before it was over, we had a 35-minute worship service in this room with my wife dying from cancer lead them in the praises of God. <laughs> That's what you call persevering in your faith. You take it all the way to the end. You, don't, you write it in your diary if you have to. Let everybody know, I might be leaving, but I'm not done yet. I've been praying prayers that we don't see the answer to, but they're coming, hallelujah. God, my grandma said, God keeps really good records. So persevere in your faith. Paul says this. So he didn't just say faith, he said love. You and I need to develop and maintain godly love. So somebody, we say this sometimes, I love you with the love of the Lord. I don't say that a lot, but I hear other Christians say it. I heard a preacher the other day say, I don't even know what that is. And I said, I do. I do. Love is not an affection. 
Love is not an emotion. Love is an action that's made after you decide to love someone. You make up your mind to love somebody, that's it. Oh, well, it's going to get a little deep. Don't say amen yet. Because if you decide to love somebody and then they start being ugly to you, have to go back on that decision, don't we? Well, I don't love you anymore. Well, then you didn't really love them. Because, you know, we all have people hurt us, and we may not, you know, do the same things we've always done, but you cannot stop loving them unless you make a decision to do it. And so you and I have to make a decision. We're going to let, now look at this. When, I, when people say I love you with the love of the Lord, I know what that means. Because the love of the world is, a fa it's phileo. Phileo, it's, it's superficial, it's fleshy, it's emotional. It's mostly tied to some kind of sexual attraction usually. But it can be other ways. It can just be, you just say it. I love you. You know, before I got married and I dated all those thousands of women that were after me, um, I had this girl one time, I was, oh, that's not true. Um, I had this girl I was dating, and I remember she said, one night she said, I, I love you. And I went, oh, no. No, no, no. And she figured out real quick, when you don't say it back, y'all understand that relationship was over. <laughs> I didn't even have to do anything. This is over because I didn't say I love you back. Because I remember when she said it, oh, I don't love you. That's what I thought. I, I don't love you. Well, listen, there's some people, come on with me now. There's some people that in my flesh, I, I got to tell you, it, it, I, I just don't have the capacity to love them. I know y'all are all better than me. Y'all just love everybody. But I've had a few people in my life, I just don't have the capacity to love them. Until I got saved. And every time I feel like saying, well, I don't love them, the Lord said, uh-uh, 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 uh-uh. I love them. And I live inside your heart. Come on, y'all, it's getting deep. I, love, I live inside your heart, and if Jesus is living in my heart, and he came to save the whole world because God loves the whole world, then I got to love the world with the love of God. Because the love of God passes my human understanding. Woo! That's what your kids need from you. That's what your husband, your wife needs from you. They need godly love in the home. They don't need you to give them some super little, superficial little pat on the back all the time. They need, you they need you to love them like God loves you. That's why we chastise our children. That's, come on now. That's why we do this because real love, God will chastise you. God will uh, convict you and, and he will even convince you and he, he, you know, but he don't always just pat you on the back and say it's okay. <laughs> so let God develop godly love in you. Amen. Number three, he says you need, to con you, need to, you need to continue in sanctity. Well, sanctity translates holiness. Holiness. So live a life of holiness that means you set yourself apart from the world. That's what holiness is. Understand holiness. Every time someone says holy, when I was growing up, I always thought of perfect, and then that counted me out. Right? Anybody else like that? I was like that growing up. Every time somebody said holy in the church, pastor would say, God is holy. You're supposed to be holy. And I said, well, that, that don't apply to me because I'm not perfect. So then I felt guilty. Are y'all with me? And I would leave the church, and I'd feel downcast. Because I said, oh, well, he pastor said we got to be perfect. And then years and years went by like that, and I heard somebody preach it right. And they said, let me tell you what holiness means. It simply means set apart from the world. And I remember that preacher preached about the cup of Elijah. And he said, the priests in the Old Testament, that cup of Elijah was set aside in the tabernacle, and you didn't touch it. Nobody, you didn't put water, and you sure didn't make no coffee in Elijah's cup. That cup was set apart, and the only thing that ever happened was when it was used in the communion, and that's the only time they touched that cup. It's set apart. Listen, set apart for a special purpose. That is holiness. 
God says, I want to set you apart from the world because the world will mess you up. Let's just talk about Eve for a minute, right? It'll mess you up. You get to listening to the world, doing what the world says. It'll mess you up. And so God says, I want to set you apart from the world. You're going to be in the world, but you're not going to be of the world. And I'm going to do something in you while you do that. And I will be able to use you for my glory if you will let me set you apart from the world. We don't do what the world does. We don't talk like the world talks. No, that's still in your Bible. And <laughs> we don't. We don't drink what the world drinks. We don't dance to the same music they dance to. And by the way, we are supposed to dance. Well, that's another, I'm going to do a whole series on dancing because <laughs> y'all have no clue about that, and neither do I, because we were raised in a bad culture that doesn't understand the power of dancing. But just get to reading on it in your Bible, and you're going to go, oh, my goodness, I need to learn how to dance again. Come on now. That dancing will break loose some stuff. If you dance in the world, it'll break loose some stuff, too. Break up your family, too, by the way. But anyway, somebody be drunk dancing with your wife. It's good preaching, Pastor. I just love when you meddle. <clears throat> Live a life of holiness. Now, remember, Paul is telling Timothy how to be preserved from the sin that came through Adam and Eve. Everything he's talking about came when Jesus was birthed to Mary. And he's telling you that's what salvation is. This is what salvation is. This is how you find your spiritual success. You, you, you persevere in your faith. You keep love and you persevere in holiness. And lastly, he says, persevere in moderation. Now, I've been anxious to preach this today. Since y'all, all the women in this church have fallen pray to the ungodliness of makeup <laughs> jewelry hair coloring but evidently my wife must have looked at my notes last night Bob because today she has a dress to the floor and long sleeves on and I'm not sure if I saw her with a straightener in there in the house trying to get that hair longer I'm not sure I think she's putting on a little show this morning. I, evidently, Gigi got it too. And Rachel, they all got long stuff on today. Y'all know why I'm saying all that, right? Because for my whole life, most of my life, and there still are in my life, certain people who still talk about this word moderation, and it's all about how our women dress and how, our, how they do, because Paul addresses those issues. And listen... Here is what the Bible says about moderation. It, it never, as a matter of fact, in the Greek, it, in that state right there, in this sentence, that Greek word does not translate moderation. That was, a guy's, that, that was a word that was put in because it covered the meaning better of all the words that this could have translated. And it translates this way, sensibleness. You can find you can find translations. I got thirty something on my 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 computer last night. I looked at all of them, just read every one of them. And there's different translations use different words in this spot. But when you go to the Greek, it could be sensibleness, soberness, sobriety. It could translate modesty because it covers those words. But. Uh, Sensibility is probably the most common translation of that word in the Greek. Sensibility. Does that make sense to y'all? It does to me. Because I always say this. The Bible, to me, is the most logical book in the world. Never makes a mistake. It's perfect. To me... Serving Jesus, following Jesus, being a Christian is the most logical thing I can think of in my life. Jesus created me, and then he said, because of your mom and dad, Adam and Eve, mother of all living, she brought sin into the world. The, the two of them brought sin into the world. Oh, come on, y'all. This, this, I don't have time for all this this morning. Y'all making me preach. Listen, Adam and Eve birthed sin into the world. 
And God said, now I'm going to birth salvation into the world. <laughs> Most sensible thing I can imagine. How's that work in our life? Just be sensible. Don't be, 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 be uh, sober. That means think through. It doesn't just mean sobriety as it comes to alcohol, and I, I believe that we can make that case, but, but, it, but how about in your mind? Be sober. James says, don't be a double-minded guy. You know, keep your eyes on the Lord. Because he said, a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. That's not sensible. That's why we meet people all the... Oh, come on, y'all. I, I know it's meddling, but it's just the truth. You can't make it on just being a Sunday morning churchgoer. I'm not even going to use the word Christian there because that don't make sense to me. That's not sensible. If all you do is just show up at church on Sunday morning, then you're not really in a relationship with Jesus. So Christianity is a life given to us by Christ to live out with him. That's why the Bible says work out your salvation with fear and trembling before the Lord. You've got to work this out between you and God. It ain't going to work out for you just coming on a Sunday morning and saying, oh, pastor, you preached a good message. Well, to be honest with you, most time people say that, I just go, oh, Lord. I do. Because I don't want that. I, I, want, I, I want you to be walking with the Lord. I'd rather you come to me and say, boy, pastor, you preach this morning, and that's just what God's been saying to me all week. Now, that tells me something. Come on, y'all. It's sensible to live for the Lord. Be sober about your relationship with God. These things that are going on in the world today, the Lord said we are not supposed to be caught up in the cares of this life. Uh, Paul says, do not let the world, in Romans, he said, do not, I beseech you, uh, brother, don't let the world press you into its mold because the pressures of life will cause you to be like the rest of the world, walking around in fear and doubt and struggle and depression and sadness, and it goes on and on, and anger, and it goes on and on and on. And the Lord says, don't do that. Be sober. Keep your mind straight. Fill your mind with the word of God. Will the two-edged sword of the Word of God against all these things that come against your life? Will the Word of God speak? That means, can I just play that out for you? That means when it comes, speak the Word of God out loud against that situation. When, when, uh, when this is so cool, man. When, when, when Blake laid his hands on Landon a week ago, he spoke the Word of God out there on that baseball field with all those moms and dads and everybody and to be able to hear it, he turned him around, laid his hands on him, and one of the things he said, by the Bible says, by the stripes of Jesus we are healed. I was like, come on, boy, preach that word of God out here on the baseball field. Because that word of God works. It's the most sensible thing ever. Is it going to affect how we dress? Absolutely. But did God put some rigid code in the Bible, some rigid religious code? And, and by the way, guys, you know, just know, you have to know this. I mean, come on, be, be, be logical here. You have to know that if God put a dress code in the Bible for women, y'all want to say it? He put one in there for you too. I love it. You walk down, you see a family that li believes that stuff, and the, and the dad walks up, and he, he's dressed like normal people, but the mom and, and the little girls come up, and their hair's wrapped up in a bun up here, because if you take that bun down, that's a sin. And they got their long dress. You know, the poor little kid, they can't they go to school. They can't play at gym class, because they, they can't. You know, they got their little tennis shoes on with a super long dress that's dragging in the dirt, and they got their sleeves down here, and they're out on the playground sweating like, you know, crazy, and, you know, and their hair's up in a bun. They're five years old. It's the most senseless thing I've ever seen in my life. Pastor, you are just doing so awesome today. This is great. And dad's out there just, yeah, just like everybody else. Can't tell. No way. God doesn't work that way. The Bible says he's no respecter of persons. So he did not put on women. Boy, I'm preaching good. He did not put something on women that he didn't put on men. I'll tell you what he did put on you, men. Sensibleness. 
How will that fit in my dress? Well, you, you'll see. I like what Ron Carpenter said this morning. He said, he said, listen, we get people come in our church. They've been saved a week, and they come down front, and they're dancing with everybody else up here when the Spirit of the Lord gets moving, and they've just been saved one or two weeks. He said, some of them are still dressed like prostitutes. He said, I don't go to them and say, get out of my church. You're not dressed right. He said, but I can tell you one thing. They stay here for a year. God's going to deal with them. And he will clean you up, and he'll do it with love and grace. He won't beat you down about it. Oh, come on. And you don't need to be taken off in a side room and have some religious site tell you how to dress. <laughs> so the turn is you turn from out of man, and you turn to life. And it's going to come through women. God said, I'm going to bring life through a woman, and it's going to turn the world. It's going to turn the world. And I'm going to tell you this morning, God has a turn for you in your life today. I don't know where you are. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what you're going through, but you listen to me. And I know it. I know if I know anything about preaching, I know when God says, this is what I'm doing. And I know this morning, God wants to turn your situation. He wants to turn your life. He wants to turn your problem. Come on now. He wants to turn something in you today because the enemy meant it for bad. But you need to know this. There's no enemy in hell that can make a plan that God hasn't already planned for. And God says, and I love the new song on the radio right now. It said, if your plan isn't good, then God's not finished yet. Hallelujah. And I'll just tell you, if it still looks bad around you today, just know this, that things are turning in the spirit and God's going to turn it for your good. If you are caught up in God and you got Jesus in your heart, there ain't nothing the devil can do to destroy God's plan in your life. Hallelujah. He said, I will turn it for good. Stand with me this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, lift your hands to the Lord. Stir up something in the Holy Ghost right now. Just begin to just begin to praise him. Hallelujah. Let praise fill your mouth. Lift your hands to the Lord and watch God begin to turn something in your life right now. Hallelujah. There's a stirring in the spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And God will turn your situation. He will move heaven and earth for you. He will move mountains for you. He will part waters for you. Hallelujah. He will change your situation. And if he can't change the situation, he will change what's going on in your situation. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Come on, sing it, baby. Sing, it. sing with us. Let this be your anthem this morning. Hallelujah. There's nothing better than you. There's, There's nothing better than you. There is nothing. Nothing is better than you. Hallelujah. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There is nothing better than you. There is nothing. Nothing is better than you. Oh, yeah. We believe and we declare. Turn beauty for our shame. Yes, you do, God. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn the morning oh, to dancing. You give beauty for our shame. Yes, Lord. You do glory. You're the only one who can. You're the only Turn graves into gardens. Oh, yes, Lord. You turn bones into armies. Whoa. You turn seas into highways. Yes, You're Lord. the only the one who can. Because there's nothing better than Whoa, you. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Better than you. Oh, I'm a child of you, too. 
same into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gods. Yes, you do, Lord. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. Hallelujah. 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 I want us to I want us to take a step of faith this morning. And if you got something in your life right now that you need to turn, I don't care what it is. It can be anything. But you need something to turn. You've been battling it, whatever it is, for a while. It might be anything. It could be sickness. It could be a financial struggle. It could be a domestic squabble. It could be anything. But if you need a breakthrough today and you need something to turn today, I want you to come stand in the front of this building. And we're going to pray together this way. Amen. Thank you. Come stand. Come stand this morning. Come stand this morning. Hallelujah. 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 Hey, hey, we saw a little turn this week, didn't we? Yeah, girl. Yeah, girl. I'm just telling you, we saw we saw something we've been believing for for a while that we saw just a look. Sometimes, sometimes, uh, uh, you know, the you know how the little bottles now they have the little plastic ring on them. You know what I'm talking about? And sometimes that first turn is real easy. And then when it grabs a hold, you got to Michael, Miles will bring one to me. Gray, I can't get it open. And it's loose. But the problem is, he just got that first turn. He can't get it to break loose. For, oh, man. Come on. So we saw a little turn, but we're looking for a big old twist. We're looking for a, we're looking for a 360. Amen. Come on, y'all. Lift your hands right here. Just lift your hands and receive this right now. Father, God, uh, come on, y'all pray faith right now. Everybody in the building, pray faith. Lord, right now, we don't even have to know what all these needs are. Some of them I might be privy to. But the truth is, God, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how big the need is. It doesn't matter how small the need is. It doesn't matter what the enemy says. It doesn't matter what the doctor says. It doesn't matter what the world says. It doesn't matter what my checkbook says. Hallelujah. None of that stuff matters because Lord you can turn a situation I believe God you're gonna do like you did for so many people in the Bible and you're literally gonna change the name of the situation hallelujah it's gonna turn it's gonna turn right now for your glory what the devil meant for bad you are turning it for good right now because you had already laid out a plan of good before we ever got here hallelujah yeah. the devil said I'll just mess that plan up with some bad but you said nope nope you can't stop my plan my plan is going to go forward no matter what and my plan is always good says the Lord hallelujah Amen. there's a turning in our lives right now God in the name of Jesus it's turning it's turning it's turning it's turning it's turning you don't know pastor how desperate it, it don't matter how desperate it is God turns situations God turns situations Look at this. I think there was a couple of apostles in the Bible that ended up in jail. And the Bible says they were chained to a dungeon wall. But the Bible says, at midnight. <laughs> I mean, that's the dark. It's dark, man. It's dark. It's, it's bad things happen. My dad used to say, bad things have to happen after midnight. So we always had, we always had a curfew that was before midnight because my dad was a police officer. He said, every police officer will tell you this is a fact, that right when that clock stacks 12, the radio starts going off. And it goes off until the dawn comes in the morning. And it's all night long in the darkness is when evil happens. And he'd say, that's why I'm giving y'all curfew, because I'm not gonna have my boys out on the street when the evil is taking place. That's good preaching. And that wasn't even spiritual. That's just, he's just stating facts. That's just facts. Well, listen. Bible says they were in dungeon at midnight and you would have thought that'd be a good time to go to sleep <laughs> but you know when you're standing up on a dungeon wall and you're chained it's kind of hard to go to sleep so you can either hang from them chains and wake up in the morning with dead hands and you know what a way to die right and so they just said well you know it looks like this ain't gonna turn out so good and somebody said I think we probably all just praise the Lord I told the prayer group this morning you need to put your joy on and some situations you got to put your joy on you got to make it happen 
and and so they just said we're gonna just praise the lord and you know pentecostals we don't we don't praise the lord quietly there ain't no quietly in pentecost <laughs> Suddenly there came a sound out of heaven, right? It started with a sound. Amen. And so they, they said, we're just going to, we're going we're gonna to praise the Lord. And they started praising the Lord. And the Bible says God shook that place with an earthquake and the chains fell off. Now that's a pretty heavy shaking. Come on, y'all. There's a whole lot of shaking going on in the church. Anyway, um, and, it, and the chains fell off and the doors opened up. <laughs> now that's a turn. That's a turn. And that's all through your Bible. What we do last week, Joshua said, we're going to march, 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 march. That's all we just preach. Maintain, maintain, persevere, maintain. Keep doing the right things. Keep doing the right things. But I'm telling you, there's a day, there's a moment when it's going to turn. And Joshua said, we will do this. And then we're going to shout. And it's going to take place. We shouted last Sunday. And boom, we sold a house. We've been waiting months to sell. Sold it while we were marching. And if that wasn't enough, she comes in the door at the house this week and she says, I got something else to tell y'all. And I went, uh-oh, this is going to be good. She said, well, y'all, some of y'all don't know this, but it's, it's a long story. But let's just say she's had a, a long struggle with her children, her two oldest girls. And uh, they've been lied to and manipulated by a spirit of witchcraft. And I'm just telling y'all the truth about it. And uh, they have been stolen from their family. Yep. And they haven't talked. You that you want to do this? No. Huh? Do you? No. How, how long has it been since you had a meaningful conversation? Two and a half years without a meaningful conversation with her daughters. And her phone rang this week after the Jericho march. After how long y'all been praying and fasting uh, on Mondays? Two and a half years they've been fasting every Monday for these girls. Sunday night, I'm sorry, Sunday nights for these girls. That's right, because we go out and eat and she'll go, uh-uh, I'm not eating. I'm fasting with Charlie for the girls. So they've been maintaining. They've been doing what they knew to do. And this week we saw a little turn. And that was a, like, what'd you say, like two-hour conversation? Over an hour, an hour long conversation after two and a half years. Now, you don't think God's turning something right there? I'm just telling you. I'm telling you. And so you just, you just keep standing. You keep doing what you know is right. You keep believing. You keep giving. You keep praying. You keep reading. You keep studying. You, st you keep, you know, uh, uh, in com you, you keep connected to the house of God. All of these Man. things, and it adds up. And then all of a sudden, boom, it turns. Yeah. I, I want to pray one more thing. Well, I'm, I'm, unless the Holy Ghost changes this. One more thing for sure this morning because we have mothers, we have grandmothers here today and um, future mothers. And uh, we have wannabe mothers. You are going to be an awesome mother. I told my wife that when you left the other day. I said, uh, well, never what I can't tell her tell you everything I said, but it was all good. And I, I'm just gonna tell you, she's gonna be a good mother. It's good word, Pastor Krausen. Thank you. <laughs> now listen, some of y'all have children. Listen, some of y'all have children that are not saved. Some of y'all have grandchildren that are not saved. Some of y'all may have great-grandchildren that are not saved. Some of y'all are trying to put your family back together. Um, now, I know this. The Bible declares that in the last days of revival, read, read the last book of the Bible, Mal, uh, book of the Old Testament, Malachi, and the Bible says God's going to turn the hearts of the sons back to the fathers. Now, that applies to mamas and daughters as well. And so God's going to turn these situations. God's turning these situations. So, daddies, you can pray this too. Um, that, that you're believing God to, to, to turn those situations where our children will grab a hold of the faith that we've handed down to them and, um, and they will be right again. Amen? So y'all grab somebody's hand next to you. Grab your spouse. Grab somebody that will pray with you. And let's pray right now for all these 
children and grandchildren and great grandchildren and future children right now father in the name of jesus i pray for all these mamas and grandmas and future mamas that are in this house today and god their families have been fighting the devil and 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 we've watched the devil steal our children from us and they've drug he's come drug them out of our homes and he's drug them off into sin and and debauchery and they're and they're addicted and in struggle and they're living in places they don't belong in they're living down in Lodabar and you're ready to get them out of Lodabar and bring them back to Bethlehem hallelujah hallelujah and I pray today God that there's going to be a turn in their children's lives right now their sons and daughters are going to prophesy one day their sons and daughters are going to come back home one day hallelujah and we believe it's turning right now God right now while we pray it's a turning right now they feel they can feel the anointing of the Holy Ghost where they are right now they may not recognize it but I know you're moving on them Holy Ghost Woo! We plead the blood of Jesus over them. We say, God, keep them. Keep them, Lord. Keep them from harm. Keep them from evil, God. And draw them by the love of the Holy Ghost back to where they belong. Hallelujah. We say to you, devil, if you're going to take one of our kids, you're going to have to do it with us kicking and screaming and fighting you every inch of the way. You are not going to take our children. We will not let the wolf come into the sheepfold and take one of our sheep and drag them off in the woods and kill them. We will not let you do it. We will not let go. We got a death grip on them children in the spirit. And we will not. We will not. We will not let go. Some of some of y'all, and I just just this Lord just brought this to my remembrance. But there's several of you in this congregation right now who have told me specifically that you have children and and uh, and other family members who have been bruised in a church, and they're not in church today because of the pain of some church they were at. These prayers apply to them. Now, Father. We are believing that you are going to let these children who are walking around with bruises. Now, Jesus, it's, been, it's already been prophesied about you, Jesus, that you took, your, took our bruises upon you. So there, the remedy for the bruise is you, Jesus. And so, so today, we declare today, we declare Jesus over them. We apply the salve of the anointed one, the Christ, on the bruises of their life. And we apply that salve on it because you are the healing balm of Gilead. Hallelujah. And I pray, God, that you will heal their bruises. Let them see clearly the difference between the work of men and the work of their God. Help their eyes to be able to see clearly. This was not you, God. You did not bruise them. You did not bruise them. People bruised them ungodliness bruised them failure bruised them false prophets bruised them false christians bruised them but jesus you did not bruise them you took stripes on your back for our bruises and we apply those stripes to their hearts right now father and we believe there's a turning right now there's a turning right now there's a turning right now This is what the Lord just showed me for you moms and dads and some of y'all that have family members who are bruised listen to me let God work through you your pastor's not always going to be the one to lay hands on people and pray for them let God work through you just like we've been watching at the ballpark the gifts of God are for the marketplace not just the church come on let God use you to lay hands on your children and pray for them. I'm not talking about just because they're Christians. I'm talking about because they have a need in their life. And you just tell them, hey, I know you may not want me to do this, but I want. I, I would like to lay my hands on you and pray for you. And let me speak specifically to, to, to you guys today. The Bible declares, and, and I know 
you may not believe this, but I believe it. There is something extra special powerful about a father laying his hand on his children. If you read all through the Bible, you're going to find that. And it's specifically, I, I know, I, I'm just being specific here, but the Bible is very specific about it. You lay your right hand on them. And that is the hand of God's blessing is his right hand. And you lay your hand on them and you say, I want to lay my hand on you and I want to pray for you. And do it. And how about this, mama? That's a good place to wield your influence. There's some things that my mother-in-law can say to me that none of y'all can. She has, the, she has that position of authority in my life right now. And she can do that. You have that position of authority in your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. And you can say to them, no, nope, while you're at my house, this is what we're going to do. And we're going to pray before we go to bed. And we're going to pray over our meals. And when you're sick, we're going to lay hands. Yes, yes, I will put a Band-Aid on you, but I'm going to lay my hand on you and pray for you. Macy got a little sick last week with a little virus or something. And Rachel called us and said, y'all should hear this macy is laying on the couch right now and i could just hear her in the other room and this is what she was saying jesus is healing me jesus is healing me jesus is he where do you think she learned that her mama and you got the influence there use it grab your kids look somebody said i don't want to offend my kid you can't offend your kid Grab your kid by the nap of the neck and say, I'm going to lay hands on you and pray for you, boy. And you mamas can do it. My, my mother-in-law grabbed me by the ears at 21 years old and told me, we don't speak in church. Be quiet. I said, and I didn't speak that out loud. I'd say, I ain't never spoke in church after she did that with her. If she's around, I'm quiet. Be quiet on the pew. Amen. She has that influence. You have that influence. called us one time she, I said uh, we were I don't know we were doing something and, and Mother's Day was coming up they they went to a really big church and we'd never been there and she said I want y'all in church with me on Mother's Day I said yes ma'am we should drop what we're doing we're gonna go be in church with mama on Monday, on Sunday because it's Mother's Day yeah yeah you can do that if I was y'all I would have did it today I would have said I'm the mama and I need you here I gotta work well tell your boss mama said and you know what? Boss will go, oh, I understand. You go, boy. You go. I'm serious. I'm serious. Will that, will your influence in their spiritual life and watch God begin to turn some things. Watch God begin to turn some things. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, love on your mama today. And if your grandma is still alive, get on the phone. Call her today. Do whatever you got to do. If you, you know, things aren't so good between you and your mama or you and your grandma. Don't, don't let that stop you from picking up the phone today and calling them and sowing a good seed in your relationship. Try to turn that thing today. Is that good? And just love on somebody. Love on your mama and your grandma today. And, and, uh, and daddies, you know, love on, your, love on your mama and love on your wife today and dote over them and tell them how awesome it is that they're the mother of your children. Thank you so much. You're so sweet. Amen. Thank you, Father. I feel it turning, Lord. I feel it turning. I feel it turning. It's turning. Hallelujah. I believe that word we shared with Pastor Ishmael a while ago is turning some things for him today. He don't know it yet, but it's turning some things. Yeah, it's turning some things. Yeah, the joy of the Lord is his strength. It's turning some things. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I feel a shift in the spirit hallelujah hallelujah and i believe today god you're doing great things and i believe it's going to continue into tonight i believe what what happens in this place tonight is going to be life-changing and again we ask you to anoint sister brooke and and uh, pastor paul as they travel over here bless them may your hand rest upon them and keep them safe we plead your blood over them jesus and uh, we, we plead your anointing on them for this evening, Father, in Jesus' name. And Lord, I bless your people. 
I, I, I bless your people today. The word of God in Deuteronomy 28 says, if we would hearken to your voice and obey and do your commandments, that all these blessings would come upon us. You bless us in our bodies, in our spirits, on our jobs, in our businesses and careers, when we work, when we play, when we come in the door and go out the door from the north, the, the south, the east, and the west, we would be overtaken by the blessings of the Lord. And you went so far as to say you'd bless everything that we put our hands to if we would hearken to your voice and obey and do your commandments. I speak and declare this morning that as we hearken to your voice and obey and do your commandments, we are a blessed people in the name of Jesus. God bless you. Amen. See you back tonight at 6 o'clock. Come early. Don't be late.